Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to our uh, next exciting event with ASPE. Uh, I'd like to hit, do a couple administrative points very quickly so that we can get this webinar underway. Uh, the first thing that I do ask is if you would each turn off your microphone, keep your microphone and cameras off until you might be invited to, uh, to participate at the Q&A time. Uh, if your camera is on, you've got people then who are going to be watching you eat or sleep or paying attention. So please take care of that. Um, we'd also like you, if you could please uh, edit your name. That's the three dots that's in the box in which you appear on the screen where you can add your location. It's nice for everybody to see who, who all is participating. Uh, throughout the presentation, you can put your questions in the chat box, okay? The chat box is accessed uh, down on the bottom of your screen. You can put your questions in there and they'll be uh, addressed uh, via the moderators. Uh, if we are successful at the time it, that we go into the uh, Q&A, uh, if you, you will be asked if you would care to directly ask your question. Obviously, you need to keep it limited. Don't get too personal. And uh, you will then be invited to turn your camera and microphone on at that time. The obligatory uh, disclaimers, if anything that is, is said or presented today is of interest to you, it's not to be considered as a medical recommendation but rather as a, uh, an opportunity for you then to take it forward to your own medical team. Okay, and with that, I would like to then introduce Mark Lichty, the chair of ASPE. Thank you, Joe. I uh, wanted to start off here by thanking Howard uh, for introducing us to Dr. Elterman. This issue of um, urination, BPH, BPH is one of the possible causes, but only one of the possible causes. It's huge. It's bigger than prostate cancer. And uh, I don't know, many of you may have experienced what I've experienced. What I've experienced is toe curling urgency. I mean, just you, you just can barely get to the restroom. And so you go somewhere and you, you're trying to figure out where the restrooms are, or, or, or in my case, so I've been trying to steer away from wearing tan pants because every once in a while, there'll be a little bit of a a wet spot and I got to blow dry the thing in the men's room or whatever, you know, everybody, everybody's got their story about this urination issue. And it's, it's very highly prevalent. Um, uh, Dean, uh, Dr. Elterman just shared with us that 80% of the men that are 80 years old will have some sort of issue with urination. So it's, it's big. And, you know, for myself, I said this before, and I encourage you all here to think about this years ago but um so this is a big issue in my own case uh, what i've done is years ago i fell going to the bathroom at night from um, a change in my blood pressure so then i began to use a urinal and to avoid that issue of falling and that's what i always do now and that's what i commend to all of you who are getting up at night think about the safety aspect of this it's easy to have a, a urinal a, a hospital urinal by your bed it, it's a good idea so um we uh aspi has has uh done a lot and you too can do a lot to promote the uh, uptake of active surveillance amongst uh, men that are on the cusp and the, uh, not all your urologists are on board on this so if you're on board on it uh, I hope that you'll mention ASPI to them and refer them to to the website um, where we're about patient empowerment we're about reducing anxiety some of you men um, still may have uh, and let me speak about prostate cancer for just a second some of you men here may still have a lot of anxiety around uh, active surveillance and totally understandable but now uh, you really have all the tools to guide you and to monitor the cancer so that that anxiety 
can be vastly reduced. And in my case, and in the case of uh, Howard and uh, some of the other people on this call, uh, I've been on active surveillance for 18 years, and it's it's not active. It's it's not the cancer that's of concern. It's the urination issue, and that's why that's why this this webinar. And so I've spoken enough here. Let me introduce Howard Wolinski. And uh, Howard, again, thank you for uh, presenting the award to uh, music that we were speaking about earlier. Appreciate that. So he's going to introduce uh, Dean uh, Elterman. Thanks, Mark. And happy Canada Day, 4th of July, and any other holiday that I may be overlooking. You're pissed off, aren't you? As you get older, you face an increasing risk of having urinary problems. Loss of ur urine control may develop for a number of reasons. Problems with the bladder and prostate gland are probably the most common, but in many men, the cause lies outside the urinary tract. And so we're lucky today to have Dr. Dean Elterman as our speaker. He's gonna talk about these urinary issues and what can be done about them. Question and answer will follow his presentation. So please enter your questions in the chat box and we may call on you. Dr. Alterman's research interests include voiding dysfunction, benign prostate enlargement and men's health in general. He is the medical director of the Prostate Cancer Rehabilitation Clinic at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. So Dr. Alterman, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much for this kind invitation to join uh, your fantastic group today. And it's a, just an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to share this July 1st Canada Day with you and uh, July 4th coming up. And so I'm just gonna share my slides, everyone can see now. That's perfect. So as was introduced, you know, we men, we get pissed off and there are many ways that urination can go wrong. And what I'd like to do today over the next, period of time is to really take you through what I hope will be a tour de force of everything from urinary symptoms and how to understand what they are and what they mean to the various types of investigations and treatments, which has really undergone a renaissance. There are so many more treatments available for what we're going to call BPH or benign prosthetic hyperplasia or enlargement than ever before. And so the plethora of choices has increased. And of course, as men get older, it becomes more common to have an enlarged prostate. And of course, being on active surveillance, being with prostate cancer, doesn't preclude you from having an, over, uh, an overactive bladder or a prostate enlargement. And so we have to be able to address these, of course, in the context of active surveillance. Um, as I was introduced, I work in Toronto, Canada at the largest academic medical center in our country. It's called the University Health Network. Uh, it's comprised of the Toronto General Hospital, the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and the Toronto Western Hospital. Uh, and I've been there for about a decade. And prior to that, I was in New York City uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering and uh, New York Presbyterian Cornell doing a fellowship in what we call functional urology and reconstruction. And so my practice is really limited to uh, urinary problems, whether you pee too much or you pee too little. So that could be prostate enlargement or an overactive bladder. I also do quite a bit of the reconstruction after prostate cancer. So things like artificial urinary sphincters and uh, slings, uh, as well as penile implants. But the real focus of my practice and the focus of today's lecture will really be on benign prostate enlargement. Uh, this is the beautiful hospitals that I work. Uh, we're the number one ranked public hospital in the world uh, and the number four hospital in the world globally. Uh, and so I'm very, very proud to be able to work at such a fine institution uh, in downtown Toronto. Um, these are my disclosures. I am a consultant for a number of companies in the field of BPH and bladder function. Uh, and the reason uh, is that, uh, you know, at the forefront of research and innovation, you need to have experts to give their contributions and, and to provide guidance. So those are my disclosures. So let's begin. I'm going to use a couple acronyms and I'll fill you in on what they mean. Uh, and throughout, uh, we'll really get to the, the Q&A at the end. So you can, by all means, put them in the chat as we go. Um, and so let's begin. So LUTs are lower urinary tract symptoms, <clears throat> okay? Uh, so those are urinary symptoms that people can experience. And male LUTs, male urinary symptoms, is a growing problem. So about 45% of men will report some form of a urinary symptom. 
And uh, more than a decade ago, uh, almost a billion people were suffering from LUTs. And in fact, we have now surpassed more than a billion people in this world having lower urinary tract symptoms. So highly, highly common. And in fact, BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is another term of just saying an enlarged prostate, is the number one reason why men visit the urologist more than needing surgery, more than prostate cancer, more than any other reason. And so there are a huge number of men in the tens of millions of men in the United States who have BPH. And of course, you expand that around the world into the hundreds of millions, if not billion. And of course, it's a major cost to our healthcare system uh, in terms of uh, interventions, uh, as well as uh, lost revenue and time uh, and its impact on quality of life. So BPH is a very common condition and LUTs, lower urinary tract symptoms are very common, especially as we get older. And so what happens is we see these little changes in the cells becoming more numerous. And the number that I always like to tell people is about 50% of men, by the time they reach age 50, will have an enlarged prostate, one in two. And that goes all the way up to about 80% of 80 year olds having an enlarged prostate. Um, and so it is very, very common. And of course, some men will have urinary symptoms in their 40s and 50s. And we don't necessarily mean that they have an enlarged prostate either. There could be other reasons that we're going to explore today as to why you may develop urinary symptoms. A quick note just on the side, you know, obesity plays a small but important part in LUTs. And uh, it's one of the contributors and risk factors. And in fact, we know that as uh, adipose tissue, prostate volume also increases. And so there's a direct correlation between the size of your prostate and body weight, body mass index, waist circumference. And so one of the key areas for us to think about when it comes to BPH and urinary symptoms could actually be lifestyle interventions and things about weight loss and health. There's a lot of terms that we throw around when it comes to prostate and prostate enlargement. And in fact, they actually mean slightly different things. So a generic term that we discuss is sometimes something called bladder outlet obstruction. Bladder outlet obstruction is essentially an increase in pressure in the bladder because it has to squeeze out the urine and a reduction in the flow. And everyone, almost everyone I think on this call has probably experienced at least that feeling of really having to go to the bathroom. And of course the urine starts to come out much more slowly. And as we age, a reduced urine flow rate could be a sign of bladder outlet obstruction. So BPH, which is really the common term that is used, is actually a histological diagnosis. So in fact, it's, it's under a microscope that we can see BPH. But the thing that men actually experience in their lives is benign prostate enlargement, which is uh, the term for an enlarged prostate. So BPH technically results in BPE, benign prostate enlargement. And finally, it's that obstruction and slow stream that results in a, a obstruction is benign prostatic obstruction. So sometimes these terms are used interchangeably, but for the purposes of our discussion today, we're gonna to be talking about BPH because that's what's commonly used. And what's really interesting is about a quarter to half of men with BPH report a slow urinary stream as well. Um, and it doesn't necessarily present until the prostate has become obstructed. So it could, this, series of events can actually take years, if not decades to develop. So you could probably have an enlarged prostate at age 50, but it might only start to bother you by age 60 or 65. When we talk about LUTs, lower urinary tract symptoms, we divide them essentially into different categories. And it makes us understand the groupings of these symptoms and what they may be attributable to. So in the middle here, you're gonna see something called voiding symptoms. And I'm gonna focus on that for a second. So when we think about voiding problems, we think about difficulties voiding. It's difficult to get the urine out. So the symptoms could be something like hesitation of urination, meaning you have to stand there and wait a long time for it to start, you're hesitating. Intermittency means the stream stops and starts, stops and starts. It doesn't have a nice continuous stream. You can have a slow stream. You can even have some splitting or uh, spraying. And at the end of your urination, you can have dribbling. And I think a lot of men have experienced what we call post-void dribbling or dribbling at the end. Now, the other group of symptoms that are very important and in fact, may be more bothersome to men are what we call storage symptoms. Storage symptoms used to be called irritative symptoms. And 
uh, we think of this as you, it's difficult to store the urine in your bladder. And we describe these as fun symptoms, frequency, urgency, and nocturia. So these are typically bladder symptoms. They don't derive from the prostate, they come from the bladder. So an overactive bladder could result in frequent urination, meaning you have to go very often. It could be eight or more times in a day. Urgency, which is in fact the most bothersome symptom men experience. The sudden desire to urinate, which is difficult to delay or defer. In other words, you need to go pee and you need to go right away. Pull the car over to the side of the road, rush in the door as soon as you put the keys in the, in the lock. That is urgency. And nocturia, at least here, is described as nighttime urgency. You get woken up at from your sleep with the sudden urge to urinate. Your bladder doesn't go to sleep when you do. So if you're having bladder contractions and overactive bladder, it is happening day and night, and it can make you go to the bathroom at night. There's another grab bag of symptoms there on the right-hand side called post-void dribble uh, sensation, like incomplete emptying or having to pee two times in a row. Uh, and those are other types of symptoms. But we're really, when, we, when I see a patient, I ask them about storage symptoms. Is it difficult to store the urine in your bladder, which could mean overactive bladder, or you could have voiding symptoms. It's difficult to void or get the urine out. And those are often prostate symptoms. And I'm gonna show you that they actually overlap quite a bit. About half of men will possess both storage and voiding symptoms, bladder and prostate symptoms, and they're actually linked. And in, in this uh, Venn diagram actually shows some of the complexity. There's this diagnosis of an enlarged prostate, and then a good chunk of those men will develop the enlargement and the obstruction. But of course, there's in that green intersection, a whole lot of urinary symptoms, some of which may be attributed to a prostate, some of which may be attributed to a bladder. And so it, it can actually be a fairly complex, uh, convoluted way of thinking about urinary symptoms. And for someone like me in functional urology, we have to tease apart what is attributable to the prostate, what is going on with the bladder. So let me talk a little bit about overactive bladder because overactive bladder, in fact, is also really common. And it could be a sign of, or the symptoms could be urinary problems, frequent urination, and again, eight or more times in 24 hours. That urgency, you have to have urgency to have an overactive bladder. Now you can develop even something called urgency incontinence. So let me paint the picture for you. You may have the sensation of a sudden urge to go to urinate and you can't wait. And in fact, it starts to come out before you even make it to the bathroom. That's what we call urgency incontinence. So that's essentially overactive bladder leakage. It's far less common in men than women who have an overactive bladder. Why? Because we actually have a prostate that acts as a little bit of a buffer and prevents the leaks from happening. But it doesn't mean to say that you can't get urgency incontinence in men. Now, this, of course, is different than stress urinary incontinence, which is an increase in abdominal pressure. So if you laugh or cough or sneeze, you can have stress incontinence. And of course, we know that stress incontinence is very common in men who have had their prostates removed for prostate cancer. And last but not least, as I said before, nocturia, which is that urgency to wake up at night. Now, what about overactive bladder? Remember I said about 50% uh, of men over the age of 50 are gonna have an enlarged prostate. Well, 25%, one in four of people over the age 60 are gonna have an overactive bladder. So again, really common. And an overactive bladder is not just for women and everybody has a bladder. And in fact, the, the prevalence of overactive bladder and storage symptoms is almost equal between men and women. So historically, there was this feeling that if you went to the doctor's office and you were a woman with urinary problems, they said, ah, it must be your bladder. And if you went to the doctor's office and you're a man, you said, ah, it must be your prostate and they would give you prostate medicines. But in fact, there's a lot of misdiagnosed or untreated overactive bladder in men because people just assume that it's the prostate. And so it's entirely reasonable to treat men with an overactive bladder and do nothing with the prostate, in fact. And so urgency incontinence and overactive bladder are really common causes of incontinence in older people. And overactive bladder may actually be a sign of uh, frailty and it's even been linked to some cognitive impairment. Uh, and so these are some really interesting parts about overactive bladder. Now, of course, overactive bladder and urinary symptoms in general can play a profound negative impact on quality of life. When it comes to psychology, we can uh, people experience depression or lack of motivation. 
uh, if you're having accidents, if you're peeing all the time, you don't want to go out. You don't want to enjoy activities. You don't want to recreate. You don't want to uh, do hobbies or sports for fear of not being able to get close to a bathroom. It can impact your work productivity. Uh, there's a, certainly an economic burden. Uh, sexuality, of course, it can impact uh, your sexual interest, libido, uh, and result in some dysfunction. A lot of people with overactive bladder and urinary problems, especially urgency and incontinence, feel high levels of anxiety, social isolation, uh, and it can really disturb their daily life. And so these are not uh, minor problems. They can have profound impacts. And people with urinary symptoms and an overactive bladder, for example, have far higher rates of depression and anxiety compared to other people in the general population who don't. So what can we do about bladder symptoms, overactive bladder, uh, urinary symptoms? Well, first line therapies could really be uh, behavioral changes. So there are things like bladder retraining where you can increasingly hold your urine for longer periods of time. In my practice, we rely heavily upon pelvic floor physiotherapists. So these are physiotherapists who have specialty training in the pelvic organs, bladder, prostate, uh, the pelvic floor muscles, and they do a lot of really good physiotherapy to help improve urgency, incontinence, uh, and even uh, a weak urinary stream. Um, lifestyle changes, it's surprising how many people will consume a lot of fluid, uh, a lot of caffeine, uh, alcohol, and all of these things can exacerbate urinary symptoms. And so there's obviously a direct correlation that not everybody clues into. We often have people saying, well, I'm peeing 10 times a day. And then of course they're drinking four or five liters of water a day. So there's no wonder. So what goes in has to come out. I think patient education is really important. You have to set expectations as to what uh, levels of improvement you can have. Uh, and as was discussed at the beginning, these toileting assistants like having uh, a urinal at the bedside can actually be really uh, helpful. And there are significant health concerns with falls and fractures in the middle of the night as people get older with nighttime urination. And so these toileting assistance aids are really important, not just for convenience, but they can actually prevent a hip fracture or something more serious uh, when you're getting up at night to pee. So when we do surveys of men and their urinary symptoms, about half will report any urinary symptom, which is pretty broad. Um, about a third, 30% will report any of those bladder symptoms, difficult to store the urine, frequency, urgency, nocturia. Uh, and in fact, anywhere from, we'll call it 15% of men will have overactive bladder symptoms. And that number, as I said, gets higher uh, as men get over the age of 60. And there is a mix, again, a very similar diagram, but again, demonstrating that about half of men will report a combination of bladder and prostate symptoms. And so it's not just a single organ problem. We have to sort of think of these as units. And you may need treatment that is targeted a little bit at the prostate, but you also might need some treatment that's a little bit targeted at the bladder. And together, you can really get some of these symptoms under control. So compared to the difficulty with urinating a slow stream, men actually report that the storage symptoms, so for example, urgency, is a more bothersome, more worrisome symptom for them, and it has a greater impact on quality of life. You know, having to stand at the urinal while you're at a sports game two times longer than the guy beside you, it's a little bit inconvenient. But rushing to the bathroom and not finding it and maybe leaking a little bit of urine is a far more anxiety provoking occurrence. Uh, and so the bladder symptoms can actually be worse than the, the prostate symptoms. And it has a huge impact on quality of life, as I, as I said. And a lot of the bladder symptoms are just left untreated. And so one of the, the big things that I try to uh, pitch when I'm giving a talk like this is don't neglect the bladder because it could be a major source of urinary problems and a good uh, area to, to pursue treatment. So why is there so much uh, overlap? Well, this is really interesting. Um, we have men who develop an enlarged prostate. And you remember the prostate sits just below the bladder and you pee through the middle of your prostate. It's shaped like a donut. Uh, and as the prostate enlarges, the hole through the middle gets narrower and there's more pressure exerted on the urethra that travels through the middle of the prostate, this narrow hole through the, the donut of the prostate. And so you can develop that slow urinary stream. But also what ends up happening is as the prostate gets bigger and bigger, 
and causes more and more blockage, your bladder, which is a muscle, has to start to squeeze harder and harder to get the urine out. And so when we do testing, we'll often see high pressure in the bladder, but low flow because there's an obstruction. So that's a sign we have bladder outlet obstruction. Remember, boo. But over time, we actually start to see changes in the muscle of the bladder. It's called the detrusor muscle. And in fact, the muscle can, first it starts to become hypertrophy to get stronger and stronger and thicker and thicker like exercising. But eventually those muscles will start to fatigue and the bladder will start to decompensate. They'll start to get stretched out. It'll start to get weaker it'll start to have a larger capacity. And the other funny thing that happens is that the messages, the signals in the bladder start to get a little bit haywire and you can actually develop an overactive bladder. And an overactive bladder is essentially when the bladder squeezes when you don't want it to squeeze, right? It's not squeezing when it's full, it's squeezing while it's filling up and it's giving you that urgency to rush to the bathroom even though you don't need to go, your bladder's not full. So indirectly, you could develop an overactive bladder independently of having prostate enlargement, right? Men will just develop an overactive bladder. But there is a very interesting relationship between having an enlarged prostate, causing the blockage in urinary flow, and then the changes that occur over years in the bladder that could eventually lead to an overactive bladder. And that's why we have so much of that 50% overlap, those two circles, as to why we have BPH and OAB, overactive bladder, coexisting so much. There is that relationship. But of course, we can treat the prostate, but we also have to treat the bladder. Now, urinary symptoms, LUTs, remember, lower urinary tract symptoms, are not so simple. Historically, we thought, ah, it's the prostate. But we're actually realizing, and we've realized over the past many years, that in fact, there could be many reasons that can contribute to urinary symptoms in men. So the top two there is what we've discussed, bladder overactivity and benign prostate obstruction. But of course, there could be things like prostate infection or inflammation, prostatitis. You could actually develop a weak bladder, a detrusor underactivity, and the urine doesn't actually squeeze out. Another interesting phenomenon, maybe we'll get into this in the Q&A, or I'll talk briefly about it now, is the second on the left, nocturnal polyuria. Nocturnal polyuria is really interesting. It is the overproduction of urine by the kidneys at night. And this could really lead to increased frequency of nighttime urination. And it's particularly more common as we get older. What happens is our kidneys are a very clever organ. And they are what filter our blood and get rid of excess salt, solutes, and water. It's our body's filtration system. And urine is the way to get rid of all of these things. And as we get older, some hormones in our body start to go down. So all, all men are used to the idea of testosterone levels going down as we get older. And of course, women levels of estrogen go down. But there's another hormone that decreases with age. It's called vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. And it's what allows us to concentrate urine, meaning uh, on a hot sunny day, for example, you're a little bit dehydrated, your kidneys are clever and they'll keep water in your body and your urine will actually be very dark and concentrated because you're not producing a lot of output of urine. So what happens as we get older is that we have lower levels of this hormone and our kidneys don't filter and keep in the water as much anymore. And therefore we actually start to produce more urine more volume of urine at night. And that's one of the main reasons why older people, as we get older in our 50s, 60s, and 70s, that's why we pee more at night. Yes, we could develop an overactive bladder. Yes, we could develop prostate enlargement and obstruction and leave behind urine. But one of the main causes is actually this kidney problem. Uh, so that's really interesting. Um, we can have urinary tract infections, uh, tumors, all sorts of reasons to give urinary symptoms. So it's not as simple as just having a prostate and having prostate enlargement. It can actually be quite complex. So how do we begin to manage an, an enlarged prostate? Well, we talked a little bit about those lifestyle modifications, right? So we've got watchful waiting, which is essentially just see how your symptoms turn out, wait until it really impacts your quality of life. 
The previous slide I talked to you about uh, behavioral modifications. So bladder retraining, the pelvic floor physiotherapists, reducing bladder irritants, coffee, caffeine, tea, alcohol, spicy foods, these are all bladder irritants, and drinking in excess, talking volume. And this idea of having to drink eight cups of water a day really doesn't have any basis in science. There's no scientific study that has ever done a randomized controlled trial about eight glasses of water. It's, it's a sort of an old wives tale. Now you do need to drink probably somewhere around two liters total fluid intake per day, roughly. Uh, so you need to have fluid for sure, but the eight cups, you don't have to necessarily have that. When we talk about uh, non-surgical treatments for prostate enlargement, we have medications. And in the bottom left here, you'll see that I've named two. So one of them is called alpha blockers, and the other are called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And I think I'm going to talk a little bit about them now. So alpha blockers, I think everybody has heard of drugs like Flomax, Hamzulosin, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other drugs that are related to it. So there's drugs called like Cylodosin or Rapiflow, uh, Doxazosin, um, Alfuzosin. These are all called alpha blockers. And what they do is they work on receptors in the smooth muscle of the prostate. And they're prostate relaxers. So they essentially relax part of the prostate to facilitate easier urinary flow. And they've been around for 30 plus years and they're really effective, right? You can take an alpha blocker, you can take Flomax, Tamsulosin or something like that and you'll pee a bit better. Now, they don't slow the growth of your prostate. They don't change the biology of the prostate in terms of its growth or natural history. Your prostate will continue to grow. And they do have side effects. So some of the side effects of alpha blockers can be uh, a stuffy nose, uh, GI upset, uh, headache. Um, they can change erections. They can change ejaculation. You can have dry orgasms. And so some men don't like to take them. The other class of drugs that are not the prostate relaxers are the prostate shrinkers. And those are the five ARIs. And there's really two. There's one called finasteride and one called dutasteride. So it's Proscar and Abodart. And these medications are designed to actually shrink the prostate. So they actually do change the prostate. Now they take about six to 12 months to start to work. So these are not take a pill and it works immediately and shrinks your prostate. The alpha blockers work really quickly. They work within a week. But the five ARI is shrinking the prostate can take many, many, many months. The other thing to bear in mind, again, with an active surveillance group like those joining us on this call, by shrinking down the prostate, it will actually lower your PSA. And so for those men taking a 5-ARI, that's finasteride or dutasteride, we expect your PSA after six plus months, the PSA should half. So when we're doing you know, a true calculation of a PSA with a man on a 5-ARI, we actually will double the number in our head. So if you used to be PSA was like three, three, three and a half, you go in your five RI, it goes down to 1.5, that's good. But as we continue to follow you on active surveillance, we're gonna have to take that into consideration. And the other thing is that these drugs can be taken in combination. And so I'm actually gonna show you on the next page here, depending on whether you have the prostate problems, you can have the alpha, blockers, the uh, Tamsulosin type uh, Flomax, relaxers, you can have the shrinkers, and you can take those for your prostate. But if you're also developing, or you can take them together, but if you also have some of those bladder symptoms, the frequent urination, the urgency, there are drugs, uh, two classes of drugs that are specifically designed to help relax the bladder. And so you, if you have an enlarged prostate and an overactive bladder, your doctor may give you, for example, an alpha blocker, Flomax. He might give you a prostate shrinker, Avodart. And he might give you a beta-3 agonist, uh, something called Mirabegron or Mirbetric that relaxes the bladder. So we have all of these ways of mixing and matching these types of medications based upon your symptoms. And there isn't a rule, doesn't mean men have to start with prostate medications. If you go into your doctor and you say, I'm peeing pretty well, my stream is pretty good, but I got to rush to the bathroom a lot. I have urgency. I wake up at night. Your doctor is probably going to want to give you one of those bladder medications, and that may be sufficient. 
So again, we have to understand how to mix and match these treatments. And there are not rules about you have to start with the prostate, then go to the bladder. Uh, the last drug, which is very interesting, you'll see it down on the bottom here, is a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. So PD-5 inhibitors are erection medications. So you're very familiar with these because they're Viagra, the most famous, Cialis, and another one called Levitra. And what was really interesting is that when we were giving these drugs for men for their erectile dysfunction, they often reported that they peed better, their urinary symptoms improved. And then through some research, we actually uh, found out that these PD-5 inhibitors, the erection medicines, actually improve urinary symptoms, fairly similarly to the prostate relaxers, the alpha blockers. The difference is that you don't get the side effects of the alpha blocker. You don't get the dizziness, the lightheadedness, the nasal stuffiness. You actually get the added benefit of having slightly better erections. And so a lot of men actually like and can take a low dose of the erectile medications. Now, the funny thing is these drugs, they have something called the half-life, which is how fast they get broken down in your body. And Cialis called Tadalafil actually has the longest half-life. And so it was Tadalafil Cialis that got approved in a low dose, five milligrams, as opposed to the 20 milligram erection dose. So one quarter strength for men who have urinary symptoms. And so you can actually get from your doctor a low dose of Cialis five milligrams once a day to treat your LUTs, to treat your urinary symptoms. And the reason we don't do the other drugs, Viagra and Levitra, is because their half-life is so short, you'd actually have to take those drugs three times a day to get the same effect. So once a day obviously is much better. So that's why Cialis five milligrams daily has been approved for the treatment of male LUTs. And so again, you could take a PD-5, you could take a, a bladder medicine, you can mix and match as required. So if those medicines work, great, uh, stay on them. If they have side effects or they don't work or you don't wanna take medicine or for, for whatever reasons, you might decide to start looking at surgery. Now there's a whole bunch of reasons on the left-hand side where we would uh, almost be forced to do surgery. We really should do surgery if they're getting urinary retention. So that's the inability to urinate, the urine stuck inside. You need to get a catheter, a tube in the penis inserted and that retention doesn't resolve on its own. If you're getting recurrent symptomatic infections from the bladder, or you've started to develop bladder stones. So if your bladder doesn't drain properly, you get urine sort of sitting there stale and the little minerals and crystals can coalesce to form bladder stones. So bladder stones aren't actually kidney stones that fall down into the bladder. They develop in the bladder and they're a sign of incomplete bladder emptying or obstruction. Some men will bleed from their prostates. The prostate is a very vascular organ and the surface of the prostate can have a lot of very large blood vessels and they can bleed for no good reason, from infection, if you're on a blood thinner. And if it keeps happening where you're having recurrent bleeding, what we call hematuria, blood in the urine, we may just have to do a prostate surgery. If you're starting to have kidney damage or kidney problems because of obstruction from your prostate, the pressures build up so high, the urine actually starts to back up into your kidney from the blockage of the prostate, then we'll need to do prostate surgery. And you can imagine before the invention of even a catheter, never mind um, prostate surgery, people would die. We're talking middle ages. People would die from BPH, right? Because they would go into renal failure after urinary retention. This was a major cause of mortality, not just morbidity. Uh, and then of course, if urinary symptoms aren't responding to the medical management, the pills and patient preference. And I think patient preference has become far more appreciated over the past five years. Many men will prefer to have a surgery or one of the new minimally invasive treatments that I'm gonna discuss, as opposed to watchful waiting, as opposed to going on medications for the rest of their lives that can have side effects and consequences. So uh, those are the reasons for surgery. Now, of course, prior to surgery, we're gonna to wanna to do some testing. Uh, we like to know the size and shape of your prostate. Uh, we like to know uh, how it looks. So you might get something called the cystoscopy, which is a little camera test where you look inside. 
And we may also get an ultrasound. A truss is a transrectal ultrasound of the prostate. And it's the most direct and accurate way of measuring prostate size. So when we talk about principles of treatment, generally, when we're not talking about those absolute reasons to do surgery, renal failure, bleeding, stones, we're kind of more talking about symptoms, right? How symptomatic, how bothered are you when it comes to your urinary symptoms? And there is a validated questionnaire. It's called the International Prostate Symptom Score, the IPSS. And it's also called the AUA, the American Urological Association Symptom Index, the AUASI. So many of you, when you've gone to your urologist, you may have filled out an IPSS and it asks you questions like, um, in an average night, how many times you wake up at night? Do you ever experience urgency with urination? Do you ever experience a slow urinary stream? And you answer it on a scale of uh, one to five. Um, and then the last question they ask you is, uh, if you could live with your symptoms for the rest of your life, could you? And then you, and that's your quality of life question. And so depending on the severity of your symptoms on a questionnaire like this, we urologists get a sense of how bothered you are, how symptomatic you are. And as you move into the mild to moderate to severe, we kind of start to think, well, maybe this guy does need to start to have some treatment. Maybe we should start to consider minimum invasive treatments, medication, surgery, what have you. And so we can look at their age. We can look at their urinary symptoms, prostate size, PSA can be helpful. And we can identify who's going to maybe progress, who's going to get worse, when should we intervene? These are some of the challenges that we face. Um, let me just pause here and have a, a brief thing because it's come up in my head about PSA and I'm sure it's gonna come up in the, in the, the talk. So I'm sure everyone on an active surveillance uh, webinar is familiar with PSA. So PSA is again, prostate specific antigen. It is uh, a substance which is detected in the bloodstream. But what's unique is that it's only made by the prostate. It's not made by any other organs. And every single prostate cell makes PSA. So PSA is not only used to uh, detect prostate cancer or monitor for cancer, but it can also be used in BPH, prostate enlargement. And one of the challenges that we have is when you get a PSA that comes back, is it because, is it elevated or is the PSA reflective of an enlarged prostate or is it reflective of prostate cancer? And that is something that we grapple with. And before we had um, MRIs and things, we were doing a lot of biopsies, et cetera, because we did had to figure out, is this PSA elevated because of infection, inflammation, prostatitis, enlargement, or cancer? So as the prostate gets bigger and bigger, you're going to make more PSA because you have more prostate cells, right? So it's normal to have a higher PSA if you have a bigger prostate. So there's a direct relationship between the size, increasing size of your prostate and an increasing level of PSA detected in the blood. What's unique about prostate cancer cells is that they make more PSA than benign cells. And that is where we get into things like PSA velocity. So you can think of prostate cancer cells as little PSA factories. They're small, but mighty. They make more PSA. So when your doctor is doing PSA over time, every six months, every year, you're not only looking at the PSA number, you're looking at the change in the PSA, the velocity. And if you have those little prostate cancer cells and they can be less than a centimeter, they can be tiny, they're making more PSA, they're causing the PSA to rise more sharply as opposed to more gradually over time from BPH. And so that's just a side note. Um, about PSA and how it, how it can be impacted by BPH, but also prostate cancer. So I think we talked about lifestyle modification already, uh, pelvic floor physio, et cetera. These are some of like the algorithms that we as doctors kind of go through. And, you know, it's not so straightforward, right? So if you have a man who presents with LUTs, do they have mostly bladder symptoms? And then we'd go through these uh, bladder medications. Do they have mostly voiding problems with the prostate? And then we might go through the drugs. And then depending on whether they have a mix of symptoms, maybe we'll give them a combination of treatments. And then of course, if they fail on the right-hand side of the screen, you're gonna exit and move to surgery. And here, these are the surgical guidelines from the AUA for BPH. 
And you can see in these boxes, there's not one option, there's not two options, there's like a dozen options. And so there's never been a time uh, in history where we have had so many options to choose from when it comes to the surgical management, the procedural management of BPH, which I think is actually a good thing, right? So historically, you could only have what was called a simple prostatectomy. You can see it on the top where uh, you do a surgery by making an incision in the tummy and you'd cut open the prostate, you'd scoop out the inside of the prostate and then sew up the, the, the skin of the prostate again. Um, and then the other surgery that I'm gonna talk about is the TERP operation, transurethral section of the prostate. That was invented in the 1930s. And those are really the only surgeries we had from about the 1930s, 40s, uh, until maybe 10, 15 years ago. And then new things started to come out. So we really divide how we approach prostate surgery based upon the size of the prostate. You can see over the arrow, we've got small prostates, average and large. And so each of these technologies has their pros and cons as well as their limitations. And limitations may be related to size or it may just be related to what they've been studied in as well. So these are all acronyms. I'm gonna talk about you know, the most common things, but you can see here that we have a lot of different things uh, I'll, and I'm going to discuss them. So this is what a transurethral resection uh, instrument looks like. It's a specialized scope, as I said, came around, developed 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, but really hasn't changed all that much. We have a light that goes through a lens. We have the scope that goes through the urinary passage. And this is really what's unique about um, urology compared to all the other surgical specialties, perhaps is that we have had a natural orifice, a natural entrance into the urinary tract. And so urology has actually been at the forefront of minimally invasive surgery because we've had the urethra, we've had this hole that we could go into to get to the prostate, the bladder, all the way up to the kidneys, in fact. And so urology has this amazing ability to do minimally invasive surgery uh, much more easily than maybe all the other surgical specialties. And so what a TERP does, which stands for transurethral resection of the prostate. And you can see on the bottom left here, there's these little loops and these little loops are electrified. And so they can cut like a cheese slicer. And what we do is from the inside of the prostate and the urethra, we can slice away these little strips of prostate tissue. Because remember the donut analogy, you have a narrow urethra, you have a narrow tube through the middle of the prostate. And the goal of any of the prostate procedures is to make the hole through the prostate, the hole through the donut wider. And so what we do, everyone always asks, well, how do you get through into the prostate? The first thing you do is you strip away the urethra that's traveling through the middle of the prostate. And then you get into sort of the meat of the prostate, what we call the adenoma. Now the urethra will heal again. It will reform. So don't worry about that. It's perfectly safe to remove the urethral lining in the prostate. The urethra is a lot like the inside of your cheek. So everyone's ever bitten the inside of their cheek. It hurts for a couple of days and then it gets smooth again. So it will re-epithelialize. It will become smooth again on the inside of the urinary passageway. So don't worry about us causing trauma to urethra because we're not. It's just a way for us to get deeper into the prostate. So this TERP technology has been around. <clears throat> this still remains, amazingly, the predominant form of BPH surgery in the world. It's the predominant form of BPH surgery in America, Canada, Europe. So we're talking first world, not let forget, you know, second world, third world. So this still remains the tried and true uh, operation. Now, of course, there've been a lot of advances and things that I think are better. Um, so now, for example, we've changed the electrical current. We now use for the engineers on the call, we don't use monopolar electricity, we use bipolar electricity. And that means that the electricity, the cathode and the anode, the electricity moves just through the loop. It doesn't travel through uh, the person into a grounding pad. And this, so this allows for better heating of the tissue, better vaporization, um, better hemostasis, meaning less bleeding. And so this is an advancement in BPH surgery. And we use loops and the, what we call a button that looks like an upside down mushroom cap. And these again, heat the tissue or cut it away and you can create this is a very nice before and after the picture. So on the left-hand side, you can see that's actually what the inside of, of the prostate looks like. That's the left lobe and the right lobe. That's the lining. You can see the blood vessels. 
And the middle picture here is the after. You can see that we've made a big cavity. It's often called the TERP defect. It's a good thing. We want to make this, this cavity inside the prostate. So now you can pee through it more easily. The back in the back there is in the dark area is the bladder. And so this is what these instruments do. About a decade ago, uh, we introduced laser vaporization. So now we're using lasers. The, the most commonly used one is a green light laser. I do a lot of these. Um, so the fancy name is photoselective vaporization of the prostate or PVP. But essentially we use a certain wavelength of laser and it comes out green, like in the color spectrum, 532 nanometers. And the laser is projected, shot down onto the tissue and the heat causes the cells to vaporize into gas. And so essentially we melt away the tissue. So instead of cutting it away, we're melting away the prostate tissue. And what's really neat about this is that it's very, very hemostatic, meaning there's no bleeding. Terps can be a little bit bloody. That's one of the downsides of Terps. You lose some blood, you have to stay in the hospital one or two nights with a Terp for bladder irrigation, wash out to stop the bleeding. Whereas with a laser, we're able to send people home the very same day. So this is a, a outpatient day surgery now, still in an operating room, still under a general anesthetic or spinal anesthetic. Surgeries can take between 30 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on the size of the prostate, but we can vaporize and clear away the tissue in a fairly bloodless fashion, and you get to go home the same day, and the recovery is a little bit faster, return to work, et cetera. So that's laser. So the advantage of the laser is that there's little to no bleeding, and in fact, a lot of men, uh, as they get older on blood thinners, atrial fibrillation, stroke, as we've just heard about. And so you couldn't really do a TERP on someone who's on a blood thinner. They'll bleed too much. But the advantage of the lasers, you could actually keep them on their blood thinner. I did one on Wednesday on someone who was on warfarin, and their INR was three, and it was completely bloodless. There's very little absorption of fluid, and it's a much safer operation. I know I'll be asked this question, and so I'll answer it in the bottom right here. You know, uh, TERP, TERP is not a substitute for a prostate biopsy. We're just going to switch over to cancer very quickly. Remember that the majority of prostate cancers are in the peripheral zone of the prostate, the outer part of the prostate. That's why we can feel with our finger on a digital rectal, the outer part of the prostate. The majority of prostate enlargement, BPH, is on the inner side of the prostate. It's called the transition zone. And so there's not a lot of prostate cancers detected in the transition zone. And so with a TERP, monopolar, bipolar, when you're getting tissue, we send it to a lab for pathology to see whether there's any cancer inside. We might as well. But the, the incidence of finding prostate cancer in TERP specimen in today's modern age, where we're doing PSA screening and biopsies and MRIs is less than 2%. It's about one and a half percent. It's really, really uncommon. And in fact, the vast majority of those, 90% of them are going to be Gleason 6, non-invasive, non-aggressive prostate cancers that are treated with active surveillance. And so I'll just say, uh, you can be on active surveillance, you can get BPH treatment, that's fine. TERP and BPH surgery is not a substitute for detection, monitoring for prostate cancer. And actually finding prostate cancer, again, in today's modern era is very, very low. Uh, and that's why in treatments that don't get tissue, like green light laser or some of the other minimally invasive treatments where we don't get a sample of treatment, uh, a sample of tissue, it's not as important because again, we're not really looking for cancer. It's not very common. Another form of treatment that's become, become a little bit popular, more so in the rest of the world, Europe, Asia, South America, something called enucleation. In the United States and Canada, uh, enucleation makes up only about 6% of all BPH surgery. So it's not very common. And in fact, there's probably, I could count on both hands, the major places in the US that offer enucleation. But enucleation is a very, very clever, and good operation for BPH. Essentially, what you're able to do is with using the scope, you can get into the space, what we call a plane, between where the prostate tissue is and its outer shell called the capsule. And I actually get into the space between the transition zone and the peripheral zone. And you can mechanically almost peel away the tissue 
in big in a one big chunk or two big chunks. And then you actually push it out into the bladder and you use a second instrument called a morselator that kind of chomps up and, and into tiny little pieces and sucks out the little pieces of prostate tissue. But you're left with an absolutely massive open prostate, a huge cavity. So it is a very, very effective, durable treatment. The chance of having to have another treatment with a nucleation is very, very low. Uh, however, there's not a lot of skilled surgeons doing it, as I've indicated. <clears throat> and one of the side effects of all of these treatments that we didn't discuss yet can be changes in sexual function, particularly ejaculatory function. Uh, when it comes to TERP operations, the chance of losing your ejaculation, and to be very clear, when I talk about ejaculation, it's uh, semen coming out at the time of an orgasm, right? We're not talking about erections, we're talking about ejaculation, semen. So when we do a TERP operation, the chance of losing your ejaculation is probably between 60 to 70%. When you do a green light laser, the chance of losing your ejaculation is probably 50%. When we do a nucleation, the chance of you losing your ejaculation is nearly 100%. And so it's a fantastic BPH operation, fantastic. But you have to be willing to give up your ejaculation, all of these, but particularly a nucleation. The latest uh, technology, and I'm, I'm sort of talking about uh, surgeries that are done in an operating room, and then I'm gonna talk about these minimally invasive treatments in an office, is something called aquablation. So aquablation is the latest thing to come out around the world. <clears throat> and this is really neat. I performed this surgery as well. So this is ultrasound guided, robotic water jet ablation of the prostate. So what we do is in the operating room, we'll put in an ultrasound into the rectum to see the prostate. Then we put in a specialized cystoscope and on the end of it is a water nozzle. And we use software on a screen to actually map out and plan in real time your individual prostate. And I can see where's the front of the prostate, the top, the back, the sides, and you can see I can click and on my screen, I can essentially plan out where the water jet is going to sweep through the prostate to remove prostate tissue. And so it takes maybe 10, 15 minutes to do the planning. But what's really miraculous is that it takes three, four, maybe five minutes for all that prostate tissue to be removed. So an operation that could take me an hour or an hour and a half takes me five minutes. So this is really the latest thing that's um, you know, sort of sweeping the market right now. You can see on the right, that's the water jet. <clears throat> and the nice thing about it is it's very efficient to remove the prostate tissue. It's equivalent to at least the TERP in terms of removing tissue. But because you can plan it out, you can actually preserve where the ejaculatory ducts are and it greatly reduces the risk of problems with ejaculation. So it's actually a less than 10% chance of losing your ejaculation with aquablation. So much more similar to your, your Eurolift or Resume and things I'm going to talk about, but you get a surgical outcome. So it kind of balances the best of both worlds. So aquablation is really uh, sort of taken the market by storm now. So there's a lot of different choices, watchful waiting when it comes to BPH, minimally invasive treatments, the drugs of surgery. And of course, they all have their pros and cons. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially it's levels of invasiveness, degrees of improvement, the side effects, and everybody has to decide for themselves what is important to them, what do they want. We have a huge number of men in the United States and around the world who have BPH, remember, but actually only about a third of them go to see a doctor. Two thirds, 26 million out of 38 million will be unmanaged. They, they just live with their symptoms, they buy herbal stuff, over the internet or on the television, uh, and they just don't get treatment properly. For those who do get onto treatment, a good number of them will go on to drugs, as we've discussed, or watchful waiting or lifestyle changes. But in the US, and this is a crazy statistic, there's only about 350,000 BPH surgeries done per year. And that is actually way more than the number of prostate cancer surgeries done per year, but it's still relatively small. And so if you think about all the work that a man has had to do to figure out he's got symptoms, say to his doctor he's got symptoms, start taking drugs, ultimately fail the drugs, where do they all go? About 1.6 million men 
We'll make it all the way to surgery, but never go through with surgery. So the question is why? Is it because you know, the currently available technologies just aren't appealing to them? It could be. Um, and so out of that, we've really introduced these minimally invasive treatments. So these at least ter alternatives to TERP because the drugs have you know, a pretty minimal risk, side effects, but pretty modest benefit. And the surgeries that I all just described to you, TERP and laser and uh, nucleation, whole app, higher risk, but higher reward. And so we now have this new category of treatments called MISTs, minimally invasive surgical therapies. Um, and so these are a little bit safer. They can be done under local anesthetic. Men will have a really good experience, less downtime, less catheterization time, faster return to work, good improvement in quality of life, and it doesn't necessarily compromise sexual function. And so again, looking at the size of the prostate, we can kind of determine what would be the best prostate treatment. So if you have sort of a uh, 30 to 80 gram prostate, some of these mists, these minimally invasive office treatments could be very attractive. So there are now three uh, FDA approved minimally invasive treatments or mists for BPH. And these are available in Canada, they're available in uh, Europe, uh, Asia, um, et cetera. So I know we have international people from all over and, and these treatments are of course available in many, many places around the world. On the left-hand side, we have something called an I-TIND, T-I-N-D, that stands for Temporary Implantable Nitinol Device. There's a little prostate stent that's left in for a week and removed. I'll talk about each of these in detail. In the middle is the Resume, that's the water vapor, uh, water steam treatment. And on the right-hand side is the Urolift, the prosthetic urethral lifter prostate staples. So people who want mist, they may not want to have a full-on surgery. They may be bothered by medications. It's really important to ask men, what are their expectations when having a mist? You know, do you want to have uh, an outcome equivalent to TERP? Because they're not the same as TERP. They're less invasive. So you're not going to remove as much tissue. But if it's important to you to get off drugs or avoid a more invasive surgery or preserve your ejaculatory function, then a mist would be a very good option for you. So the Eurolift for people who don't know, and th they have a lot of commercials. They're very popular in the U.S., it's these little implants. You could think of it as a, a, a prostate staple. And you have this instrument that essentially pushes the lobe to the side. We shoot this prostate staple through. It hooks onto the outside part of the prostate. It deploys on the inside, on the urethra, and it squeezes the lobe together to effectively widen the channel, widen the hole that you pee through. It has very good data, lasting up to five, uh, five years of data that we've followed. Now, the one thing to remember is the retreatment rate is around 15% who need another surgery, another 10 or 11% who need a, a, a go back on medicine, so 25%. And the other thing that I'll say about Eurolift to active surveillance group is that you're putting in these metal clips into the prostate and they can cause some interference with the MRI images, right? Because you can the metal can give a little bit of a shadowing. Now, the radiologists say that, yes, we can change this feature, we can change this function, we can kind of um, subtract out the influence of the Eurolift clips, the metal. But I would just say that there is a little bit of concern for men who are on active surveillance that uh, we may not, we may not want to do a Eurolift uh, only because it could potentially, in theory, interfere with the surveillance uh, when using an MRI. Okay, so I'll make that comment. Resume is convective water vapor thermal therapy or water steam treatment. This is again, a minimally invasive five minute procedure. I do all of these procedures. Um, you go in with a specialized scope, a little needle about a centimeter long is deployed into the prostate. We inject the steam over nine seconds. This hot 103 degree steam travels through the prostate. It kills the cells instantly. And then <clears throat> over about a one to three month period, the prostate tissue will shrink down, it will slough off, and you'll get an opening of the prostate. Uh, so this is a very good, reasonable treatment, even for men who are on active surveillance. The only caveat or comment I would make when it comes to active surveillance men is that you'll expect your PSA to spike way up. You've just steamed your prostate. And so we tell men not to do a PSA for at least six months after the resume because you could get a false elevation. And you can see here a really nice example of a big prostate causing an obstruction on the left. And after the steam, you no longer see that big prostate, that big ball in the middle. It's really opened up pretty nicely. And this would be a, 
you know, a four or five minute treatment tops. And it improves symptoms very nicely. And the retreatment rates are about 10% um, lower than the Eurolift uh, treatment rates. And the ITIN, as I said, is this, the newest one. And it's like a little stent, a little cage. What we do is we put it into the prostate and it slowly expands over the course of a week, seven days. And it has these three arms and it causes ischemia and necrosis, essentially these deep grooves that get made into the prostate. So you essentially stretch and open up the outer part of the prostate uh, at the bladder neck. And this can be a very effective treatment as well. And it's not left inside the body. It's removed after the seven days and it has, you don't need a catheter afterwards and it still preserves the erections and the ejaculation. And so these three options are really good. And then the latest, I'm gonna go through just very quickly is stents. This is like the latest, hottest topic. A lot of my research is in stents. In the 1990s, they tried to use stents like in the heart, but they really failed because they weren't really well designed. And so we really sort of thought about, well, you can't just put a cylindrical stent made out of stainless steel in the prostate. It's gonna have all sorts of problems. But we've kind of thought about how to mechanically open up the prostate, change the material, have it so it's easier to Im improve uh, symptoms. And so you can see from the slide, there is a whole bunch of new prostate stents that are currently under clinical trial. Uh, and I'm an investigator for a lot of these, but I just wanted to show you, give you a flavor of there's going to be even more options available coming out over the next three to five years of devices that are going to be really easy to put in, in the office with a flexible scope, no need for anesthesia, easy to remove if they're not working or you don't like them. And they will provide a good option alternative to surgery, but also to medications as well. So here's an example of something called the Zenflow stent. You can see it looks like a kind of a corkscrew that we put into the prostate. Here's another one that's got like a four arms called a Proteon Eurocross stent. Here's another sinusoidal stent that we're putting in called a Pro-V. Um, there's now a balloon that's got drug coating that expands open the prostate. Uh, and so that's something that's really uh, exciting. We're doing a clinical trial right now. So this is my very last slide. EPH is extremely common. Even men on active surveillance can and should be treated if they have symptoms. Uh, we've gone through all the various treatments that are available from the drugs to the surgeries to the new minimally invasive mists. Um, it depends really upon your preferences. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity here in the future. So with that, I've spoken for long enough. My best uh, Canada Day greetings from Toronto. And it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to join you on this Saturday uh, with your fantastic group. So I will open it up for the Q&A portion. Well, okay, uh, Dr. Elchman, thanks. I'm grateful uh, to hear your presentation. I'm sure everyone has learned a lot. I learned not to worry about getting dehydrated because I'm not getting enough water. And I was impressed that steaming your prostate will increase your PSA. So we, we have a bunch of questions queued up. I'm going to start off with a, an email question, and then I'm going to switch over to Martin Gewertz, who's been uh, going through the chat. So I'm going to start with a question from Don from Colorado, and it is, I have a hard time understanding the mechanics of our bladder and sphincters, which prevent us from voiding. It seems if you open the valve, gravity should allow us to void completely. What happens to make it feel like, quote, yep, I'm done, end quote, then sometimes it could be two minutes or 20 minutes and it's time to go again. I have not researched this enough so far to grasp what's going on to prevent us from voiding completely. So, so doctor, can you explain that, uh, that yeah. uh, leftover feeling? <clears throat> it, I mean, it's a complex thing because it's not just one, um, piece of anatomy, right? We have a, a lot of things working together. So think of it this way. You've got this ball, which is your bladder, and it's a muscle. And either that muscle is going to squeeze hard or it's going to squeeze weakly. Remember, we talked about the bladder can fatigue over time. Or you could have an overactive bladder where you feel like you, you need to pee again. And then you've got the prostate sitting right below the bladder. And we often talk about the prostate as being an internal sphincter and an external sphincter. The internal sphincter really doesn't exist. 
the bladder neck is kind of just where the prostate and the bladder meet and we can cut away the bladder neck and you don't become incontinent because the main thing that keeps the, your urine in is your external sphincter, which is a muscle that contracts and relaxes. Uh, and it's past the prostate. It's on the distal far end of the prostate in the urethra. And so if you feel like you're not emptying all the way, it could be that you have obstruction from your prostate and you only partially empty your bladder, and then you'll get the sensation of again of needing to urinate, and then you'll want to pee out some more. So some people pee a little bit, they leave behind urine, they get a sense that they're not peeing, they're not emptying, and then they can go to the bathroom and kind of squeeze and get a little bit more urine out. And again, some men will have some post-void dribbling, which is just a little bit of urine that, that sort of trickles down, and um, it could be from the prostate being enlarged and urine sort of trapping inside the urethra, um, in the prostate or, or the, the sphincter, you know, sort of relaxing a little bit too much. So complex question, because there's a complexity as to why you may, may have those symptoms, or you can just have an overactive bladder and just feel like you need to pee at inopportune times. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Do you have a question or two? Yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, thank you, doctor. Um, this was incredibly informative. I, uh, as an advocate, I work with men one-on-one uh, -on -one, and many have uh, questions about all of these treatments. So it's been very, very helpful. Um, I'd like to ask if uh, Robert Wood would like to ask his question regarding uh, PAE. Is Robert still with us? You can unmute yourself. All right, otherwise, actually, I'll okay. ask. I'm on the back. Okay. I guess um, I've heard that uh, prostate artery embolization, a minimally invasive treatment for BPH, um, blocks the flow of blood to the prostate by using a small incision. Could you give me your opinion on the eff efficacy of this treatment? Sure. So Broadly speaking, embolization means blocking the blood flow to an organ. You can embolize your kidney, your liver, your spleen, your prostate. How is embolization done? It's a lot like an angioplasty. I think a lot of people have heard of angioplasty. So they can go in uh, through your wrist or your groin in an artery and using x-rays, they can guide their way with a tiny little instrument through the highways and byways of your arterial system all the way down to your prostate. And they can inject these micro spheres, think of it as like little glue, into the artery on the right and the left that supplies the prostate. And by blocking the blood flow to the organ, it is deprived of its nutrients, its, its blood flow, and it will shrivel up, it'll shrink. And so that is the principle of an embolization. Um, prostate artery embolization is a treatment that is available for BPH. It is a bit controversial in that, number one, it's not done by urologists, it's done by interventional radiologists. So the first caveat I would say is you need to make sure you're seeing a urologist who has expertise, because if you go to an interventional radiologist and they say, oh, sure, you've got a prostate, I'll embolize it, but you had an overactive bladder, and they misdiagnosed you, you're getting the wrong treatment. So I hope I've explained to you that there is a complexity in LUTs and you need to have the right diagnosis. Uh, number two, um, it's not good for every prostate. I think PAE is very good for a bigger size prostate. So there isn't a big advantage of doing PAE if you have a 40 gram prostate. So in my hospital, we do have a PAE program, but I'm the medical director. I decide who gets a PAE. And we typically have a cutoff of about 100 grams, 100, 100 mil size or bigger to get a PAE. Additionally, there has been studies. There, in fact, has been a randomized study, the highest level of evidence against TERP. And the rate of re-intervention was much higher for PAE, meaning PAE doesn't last as long as a surgical intervention. That all being said, if you're a man who has a big size prostate, who truly has voiding symptoms, or yeah, voiding symptoms, slow stream, you've seen your urologist, um, and you want to have something that's minimally invasive, that uh, will preserve some sexual function, although it still has an ejaculatory dysfunction rate of 14%, I think PAE is an option. I'm not going to say it's not. Um, 
but so, like so the, all the things I've described, it's not it's not perfect. So the intervention or the the, re, the having to do it again with the with the uh, prostate artery embolization, it has to be less than five years because a five year term is for TERP. I, the number that I'm giving when I say one year, two years, five years is just the length of time that the study was conducted. So when I say the five-year durability of something is X, Y, Z, it's only because we took a group of men and at five years, we calculate how many failed and how many needed another treatment. So it's not to say that all of them will fail at five years. It's like at five years, what is the percentage of men who will fail? So all I'm saying is that the rate of men who fail PAE at a certain time frame will be higher, but there will be men who had a PAE and it'll last them for a long time. So, so that's just my point with PAE. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Robert. Um, just one more question, but before I say that, I just wanna tell everybody that we've gotten over about 20 questions through the chat. Um, Howard has um, a couple, one or two uh, that he received pre, um, pre, uh, meeting. So um, if you'd like, please email your question to us as, at uh, contact us at aspatients.org. I've also um, saved all the questions from the chat. So we'll try to, uh, if you can't get any answers from your own doctor, uh, we'll try to um, address them. Um, so doctor, one more question. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me get to, okay, from John Burns. Um, John has asked, uh, what is a safe, reasonable time frame for the use of an indwelling catheter prior to a TERP or green light treatment? There, there isn't actually a safe uh, maximum amount of time. Um, you know, on the one hand, if you go into urinary retention and you get a catheter inserted, it would be, re it would be reasonable to start your own an alpha blocker, a flow max, give it a couple of weeks and then try again. I wouldn't let a urologist rush you to surgery at the first instance of retention. You need to sort of fail uh, the, what we call a trial without catheter. Um, it, what's quite amazing is that the, the catheter will travel through your sphincter and um, the sphincter doesn't lose its memory. So amazingly, you know, we see people who have had catheters in for six months, 12 months. I had someone who recently had a catheter in for 18 months. And I did his prostate surgery and he's peeing just fine now. And he's not incontinent because the sphincter didn't lose its memory. So um, now a catheter should typically be changed every, we say four weeks, four to six weeks. And that just reduces infection. But you can, you can live with a catheter. I mean, there's men who just don't want to have surgery or who are unfit to unhealthy for surgery. And they will just choose to live their lives with a catheter, especially like much, much older, older men. Uh, towards the end of their lives, right? So the, those catheters get changed every four weeks, give or take. But that's just to reduce the risk of infection. It has nothing to do with, you know, anything else. Thank you, doctor. Howard, over to yes. you. Yes. Yeah, before I, I ask, um, Dr. Alterman, um, when we originally spoke uh, here, you want to, I think we were talking about cutting off at uh, one thirty Eastern. Are you able to hang around a little bit and take a few more? I questions? think, yeah, let's go to maybe quarter two, another okay. 20 minutes. Yep. Okay. I, I have a couple of questions and then I'll turn it back over to Martin. Um, okay. I have a question from Richard from Ohio and he said, and, and this uh, gets at something I think you were bringing up. With, with, with the LUTs. There appears to be conflicting information regarding whether prostate cancer has warning sy symptoms such as with the urinary process or not. What is the reality that men should be aware of in order to be on guard and, not to, and to avoid panic? And I, I can tell you, I read a lot of the British press especially, and they're constantly saying that low, lower urinary tracked symptoms are, are symptoms for prostate cancer. And so, yeah. you, you know, and as far as I can tell, that's a myth. So is this the truth or is this a myth? Uh, it is a myth. So first of all, you know, when men come into the office to discuss their BPH LUTs, 
one of the main things they want to hear me say, their doctor say is, you do not have cancer. These are not symptoms of cancer. And remember that the vast majority of prostate cancers are microscopic, right? They are cells. And even if you have a MRI that shows a two centimeter tumor uh, in your prostate, you can't feel it. And it's often on the way outer part of the peripheral part of your prostate and it's asymptomatic. Um, the only time you will develop urinary symptoms from prostate cancer is if you have a very, very, what we call locally advanced prostate cancer. So it has just not been detected and it has grown so advanced and so large that it essentially takes up the whole prostate and has started to invade into uh, the urethra and cause obstruction. We just do not see that this often uh, in the 21st century because thankfully um, men go to the doctor, they go for PSA screening, uh, they have MRIs, but certainly in other parts of the world, um, a lot of cancers are, are de detected very late because they've developed symptoms, but certainly um, LUTs and urinary symptoms are not indicative of prostate cancer. In, the, in, 90, in 99% of cases. You wouldn't know it if you read the British press. I can tell you that. Um, I have a couple of, <clears throat> I mean, this audience is largely um, made up of men who are dealing with uh, prostate cancer. So I have a couple of questions relating to prostate cancer. How common is incontinence after a prostatectomy? Mm. So um, almost all men will have some form of temporary urinary incontinence after a radical prostatectomy. You know, it's very, we're talking in the first days to weeks after. Um, we usually measure continence rates um, after a year. And with really good, you know, surgical treatments rate, treat, treatments now using minimally invasive treatments, whether it's open or robotic, uh, you know, the continence rates are high. I'll put it over 90%. So that's probably about 10% will have incontinence uh, lasting over a year. Um, it used to be higher. And again, it depends on, you know, surgeons quote different rates. Um, but continence, incontinence rates are fortunately lower than they used to be historically. Now, erectile dysfunction is probably higher, right? Probably about 40% of men will have some form of erectile dysfunction. Gotcha. Now, I think you alluded to this a little bit, but what percentage of men found that they they have prostate cancer because they, they've had a TERP and the chips are biopsied? Yeah, are less, than two, less than 2%. And the vast majority of them are going to be least than six. So uh, finding, finding prostate cancer on a TERP specimen in 2023, today or over the last 20 years, 10 years, is very, very low. Gotcha. And what percentage of men on active surveillance also have BPH or, or don't have the BPH? Well, remember, they're not related, right? So you can, yeah. you're going to develop BPH one in two, 50%, up to 80% of men. And then you've got, you know, like the one in six to one in seven men who develop prostate cancer in their life. And, you know, a lot of them will overlap. But I would say um, it doesn't matter if you have prostate cancer. It's sort of more like, all these men who are on this call today, if you're on active surveillance, you're also a 62-year-old guy. You're also a 74-year-old guy. And you have a high, much higher chance of actually having BPH. And so they, they just, they coexist just because you're a man and you're getting to a certain age in your life. Um, and so, you know, a, another takeaway is just because you're on active surveillance doesn't mean you can't treat your very common and very bothersome urinary symptoms and, and BPH. Gotcha. Martin, do you want to take over now with some other questions? Uh, sure. Um, so Robert, uh, Robert Wood had a follow-up question on, uh, on Ray Zoom. Uh, Robert, are you uh, still with us? Yes, I am. Do, are you the one who had the follow-up question on Ray Zoom? I had the question on Prostate. Oh, I'm sorry. It was. I'm sorry. It was Robert Long from Toronto. Robert. Yes. Yes. I'm still here. Great. If you want to ask your follow-up question on Ray Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it, that looks very attractive to me, but I wonder, does it matter the size of the, it's the volume of the prostate? Is that a factor whether a candidate for resume or not? So, um, resume was studied originally in a clinical trial in prostates that were between 30 to 80 grams. And what happens when you do a clinical trial is the men who were studied are a representative group and you submit that to the FDA or Health Canada or the European Union, and that's what it gets approved for. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean you can't treat other types of men, but it may be uh, what we call off-label, or there just may not be a lot of evidence. Um, in some countries, they'll say, you know, resume is for men between 30 to 80, and other countries, they'll say resume is for prostates 30 and above. Um, and insurance has a lot to play with that as well. Where I work in Canada, we don't have the same uh, insurance restrictions as you do in the US. And personally, I have, as a University of Toronto professor, studied Resume in larger size prostates, and we have published our results. And so we have done hundreds of men who have prostates bigger than 80 grams, and we've shown that they actually have just as good a result as men who have smaller size prostates between 30 to 80. So you may read that resume or this or that is, is approved for or good for men of a certain size prostate, um, but there may be additional applications and additional research which has shown, for example, that you can do bigger prostates. The same may not be true for other technologies. So like uh, ITIND or Eurolift, where you're actually putting mechanical things in, a bigger prostate it may not work because, for example, your lift, the clips, those little implants won't reach the outside of the prostate if it's so big. But at least with Resume, we have been able to study and show that it can be done in much bigger prostates. Okay, okay, thanks. So even though what I almost have my own little clinical trial, if I, I'm not sure, but I think my prostate's 120 cc's. Or so, no, no. I mean, I, every, every week I do patients with 120 gram prostates with Resume. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Um, doctor, I have a two-parter here from two different people, but they're both on the same subject. So the first part is, uh, are there any studies um, that are out there addressing um, diet as having an effect on BPH? And the second part of that um, would be from someone else, can eating a high water content food like salad for dinner, increase the need to urinate at night. So can I, can when I we talk about something to, to that, I have a question that relates to that, uh, Martin. Uh, do any dietary supplements like cranberries help prevent or treat urinary issues? So Right. Um, so no particular order. Any food or fruit that contains fluid is considered water content. So when I talk, remember about those eight glasses of water or two liters a day, two liters of fluid consumption includes coffee, tea, juice, soda, uh, fruits, vegetables, soup, salads, right? So if you, you have a lot of water in, um, in vegetables, cucumbers, lettuce, whatever, that's got water. So that counts towards your fluid intake. Um, the second question about uh, dietary supplements. I have to say that the evidence is exceptionally weak for things like stinging nettle, this bee pollen, this herb, et cetera, when it comes to BPH. Um, there have been some studies looking at saw palmetto, the berry, saw palmetto. However, it has to be an extremely pure and high concentration of saw palmetto. There is one preparation in Europe uh, by a pharmaceutical company that makes it. And there may be, I don't even know if there's an American brand. And so buyer beware, we have done studies. Actually, we recently did a study where we'd got 40 different kinds of saw palmetto extracts bought from Amazon, CVS, internet. We sent them to a lab and all 39 out of 40 of them did not have pure saw palmetto, so they were adultered, or they did not have enough of the active ingredient required for it to be effective. 
So this is a real Wild West buyer beware. Be careful because a lot of these will interact with prescription drugs you're taking. You don't know what's inside them. They're not FDA uh, regulated or Health Canada regulated. And yes, there is truth that, you know, um, saw palmetto can be helpful, but it has to be in the correct high dose concentration, pure level. And really that's just not available. There's again, as I said, one preparation in, in Europe, there might be something in the U S but it's very, very hard to come by. So anything that you find in a store over the counter, I can guarantee you, uh, will not be effective, unfortunately. And cranberry has been shown to reduce urinary tract infections. It has no benefit for, uh, urinary health. And again, it's the same thing. There has to be enough of the active ingredient found in cranberries called proanthocyanidins or PACs. And you have to have 36 milligrams of PAC in your uh, cranberry extract for it to be effective against UTIs. So cranberry juice, dried cranberries, cranberry plus, plus herbal remedy doesn't work for you. The first question about... Um, lifestyle and weight, et cetera. As I showed you at the beginning, obesity, oh, being overweight, having a high BMI, having a big waist circumference, the more notches in your belt does actually result in a bigger prostate. So the opposite is true. If you can lose weight, if you can become thinner, if your waistline can get smaller, your prostate symptoms will improve as well. So there are actually prostate and urinary benefits to losing body mass and weight. Great. Um, all right, uh, let's see. On urinary retention, acute ur urinary retention, is there anything that um, a patient can uh, direct his doctor uh, to minimize um, urinary retention following a biopsy? That question is from David Keller. So unfortunately, um, you know, urine retention is a possible and slightly unpredictable side effect of a prostate biopsy. It is pretty rare, I will say. Now, if you're someone who was already, you know, who's at risk for going into urinary retention? If you asked me, I would say the guy who's not peeing very well to begin with is more at risk of developing retention than the guy who pees perfectly fine. So if you already have a little bit of an enlarged prostate, if your urinary stream is a little bit slow, you're probably at more risk of retention than the other guy who's peeing perfectly well. Um, so what can you do? Well, if you're already not on medications, you should be on you know, an alpha blocker. If you go into retention, they're going to put you on an alpha blocker to try and get you out of retention. So they'll put you on like a Flomax or something like that. Um, but we don't routinely give men Flomax in the week before a biopsy to minimize the risk of retention because it is still a pretty rare event. Yeah, Dr. Alterman, um, how common is bladder cancer in patients who already have prostate cancer? Is there any relationship between the two? There's not a relationship. Um, the only commonality is that prostate cancer and bladder cancer are among the top five cancers. What's really interesting is that the urologic cancers are amongst the common. So prostate followed by kidney and bladder, I think are number two, three, and five amongst cancers with you know colorectal and, and uh, something else. So there's no relationship. There's no like common, as far as I know, common genetic uh, or uh, hereditary aspect of it. Uh, it's kind of just bad luck, frankly, if you ended up getting both bladder and prostate cancer. Um, yeah. And then I don't know if you had already answered this, uh, but Maurice asked, uh, what, what is the likelihood after a TERP uh, to restore functional urination that uh, the prostate will enlarge again? So the likelihood of improving functional urination after TERP is very high. I mean, TERP is a fantastic operation, as is, you know, all the surgeries that I've told you about. They're all intended to improve and restore function. Um, the question is, how long is it going to last? And, you know, we often tell men that their surgical retreatment rate after surgery could be anywhere from 1% to 2% per year. 
So every year, one or 2% of men will need another surgery. Um, we used to sort of tell men terps are good for 10 years. That's kind of a good round number to hang your hat on. Um, so for some men, the majority of men, in fact, a one time surgery will be enough for the rest of their lives. But just statistically speaking, a percentage of men will need something. And it's because they just grow prostate tissue back more quickly. I mean, that could just be one, one factor. And uh, the, I hear the clock ticking. I think we have three more minutes. Um, and I, I see a question uh, from Beverly Keeler, Beeler, sorry, uh, about how effective is pelvic physical therapy in improving symptoms? And I'm assuming this means after a prostatectomy. After a prostatectomy, pelvic floor physiotherapy is almost a must. I mean, I encourage it to all of my patients. Um, it will, it's been shown to help uh, restore continence faster. In other words, you have two men who are leaking urine after having their prostates removed. If the one man who does pelvic floor physiotherapy, he will become drier sooner than the man who does not do physiotherapy. Um, now, for those men who have, say, an overactive bladder, there are things that you can do in pelvic floor physiotherapy to help um, reduce the urges, the urgency of doing urina of your frequent urination. Uh, physiotherapy does not shrink your prostate, so it's not going to help you there. Um, but so physiotherapy can be beneficial in the right circumstance for sure. And Martin, anything else on your side? Um, let's see. I had a. Um... What is the likely from art in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania? What is the likely cause of postural urinary ur urgency and urinary leak in absence of BPH? How is it managed? Postural urgency? Yeah. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, what's really interesting is that um, so changes in body position, postural, meaning if you get from a seating to standing or sort of lying down position or starting to walk, can actually uh, provoke a overactive bladder contraction. And so many people who have an overactive bladder may get a sudden sense of urgency when they start to move about. Uh, and so that could be part of it. It could be that they actually have an overactive bladder, which is sort of triggered by certain movements. Also people just get an overactive bladder when they hear running water or they get close to a bathroom and something sort of triggers in their mind that they need to go, they get a sudden urgency. Well, you know, it's exactly 12, well, 145 East Eastern time. So, you know, maybe uh, it's time to quit. Uh, you know, Dr. Alterman, thank you very much. I don't know if Mark Lichty wants to make some just, final comments. Just two, two uh, comments. One is, uh, uh, all of the men here need to know that Dr. Elterman is donating his time. We we don't have a real big budget, so we appreciate both your generosity and your thoroughness. Uh, I also wanted to mention about the uh, ejaculation issue. I've had green laser and terps and... Uh, so I ended up with no ejaculation, but I still have full sensation. And so it's almost a benefit not to have the ejaculation. So for those men that are weighing these different procedures, uh, I, I can't speak on behalf of all Turks, et cetera, but I can speak on behalf of my mind and the, the sensation remains. And uh, so don't, don't, I'd suggest you not weigh that ejaculation issue too much in your decision-making process. Dr. Alterman, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure and um, wonderful questions. I think there's something to take away from this discussion for everyone. I could spend the whole afternoon. I love this. I mean, this is my, uh, my passion, my day-to-day, -day, uh, but I've got my kids outside. It's a beautiful sunny weekend and I should probably spend some time with them as well. And you all should get out and enjoy a wonderful uh, holiday weekend as well. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, you. you can send me through some of these questions and if there's any that I can sort of easily answer, that would be great. So um, 
Thank you, Doctor. Happy, happy July weekend, everybody. Thanks Thank for having you. me. It's an absolute Thank pleasure. You.